Hey everybody, this is Dave Cooper and we are at the UK headquarters of Bryden Wood in central London. And sitting with me is Phil Langley, head of creative technologies. Phil, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, so this is exciting that we're gonna talk about what the head of creative technologies does at Bryden Wood today because you guys are doing things that others haven't even thought of doing yet and speeding up the process and what we do. Can you tell us a little bit about your role and what that involves here? Sure, um, yeah, I lead the creative technologies team, which is our specialist computational design and software development group. Uh, and we make software. We're not really software developers by background. We're all architects and engineers with a passion for the built environment, but also yeah, a huge kind of commitment to digital technology and changing the industry through software. So when you say changing the industry through software, how is technology really driving this industry forward and how are you using it here at Bryden Wood? So I would say a typical use of technology in AC space is yeah, like using it to help an architect or an engineer design a building. Our approach is really to shift that uh, use of software much earlier in the process, engaging clients and customers in, in the development of those technologies and the use of those technologies to make their projects much more intelligent, much smarter, much earlier in the process. So when you say much more intelligent, much earlier in the process, why? What what is change? What are you changing that other people aren't doing already? And what is the reason for that change? So a big focus for us is design automation. Um, I think that you know over all the years of the AC industry, lots and lots of design intelligence has been has evolved in the heads of engineers and architects, and that's that's often constrained. And clients and customers aren't able to access that. So we want to share that knowledge, share that know-how um, with clients that have really big pressures to deliver large programs of buildings, whether that's buildings or, or infrastructure, uh, at speed, at scale, around the world. Um, so how do you do that? How do you make sure that they're, that they're able to achieve those goals and also hit targets around quality, around safety, around carbon reduction? And so what we're trying to do is encode those kinds of requirements as early as possible. And in, in the technology you're using, you said something earlier that was interesting to me, that you're designing software that normally the AEC community would use, the professionals in the community, but you're designing it so that the average person like myself could actually go in there and start using Absolutely. the design. Absolutely, that's, that's, that's really critical to what we do. We've done projects where uh, we made software for school design in which children were able to design their new primary school. Um, and that's kind of maybe the most extreme example of it. And we have projects that are much more technical than that, much more, uh, I would say, sophisticated. But it's, yeah, it's fundamental to that. I want my mum to be able to use it, really, and right. to, to design a building or a piece of infrastructure. And sure. I think there's a way of genuinely democratizing design through this as well. I think it's about uh, transparency as well mm -hmm. as inclusivity. So with the new design software that you're using, we were talking about generative design, parametric design, what other? Uh, well, we use procedural algorithms as well, but I guess our approach is kind of, it's very agnostic to those, those kind of terminologies. What we're really interested in is finding the right solution to deal with the problem that we encounter. We don't have a preconceived idea necessarily of exactly how software um, uh, addresses a particular need. We're very open to what that could be. We have projects that, that use different types of design automation algorithms. We have projects that we deploy uh, to web applications for scalability uh, and other things that, that are more in-house and desktop use. So we're right. very, very open to what that could really be. What is the value to what you're doing here to the end user, if you were to kind of sum it up? Uh, quality, intelligence, speed. And that's predictability. What they, that's what they get out of it, really. Yeah, yeah they, they get to take a, a huge degree of ownership about their design and delivery process. By pulling all of the digital technology uh, up front, uh, you create this kind of golden thread of data for them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the clients we work with are owner operators of their, build, of, of their facilities. Right. So they re the bit in the middle of building it is just an inconvenience. Right. That's the bit, they need that to go away. It's not their business model. The, the upfront decision making is tied to their business outcomes. And then of course in operation, that's fundamental to them. So what we're trying to give them is, a, is, a, is an ability to have an upfront digital twin of their existing assets um, and connect the two things together, kind of planning and operations. Right. So outside of the AEC, the stakeholders of the company have more control of their project because they know all the bits and pieces upfront all the way through the deliverable. Exactly. And that includes everything from what the sustainability factor is, what the predictability factor is, to what the cost you know, of that project 
is going to be. Absolutely, and also how that project will um, operate within the wider um, collection of buildings that they, right. that they run. So yeah, that, that, that sort of transparency, if you like, that ability to make better decisions. Right. And I think that's really fundamental to it. Like a lot of the clients that we deal with, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're dealing with big, big projects across a huge kind of geographic areas, mm -hmm. uh, and lots of variabilities uh, right now economically and all sorts. Sure. And so, how can they kind of be agile to mm -hmm. respond to those kinds of things as well? And and yeah, not really go into these kind of projects blindfolded or in some way with their hand behind their back. Right. So so using the software, and we're going to get a demo here in a second. Uh, you can make real-time changes, Absolutely. and the speed of the changes, the speed of the design, I mean, it's literally real-time, it's fast. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that you know, conventional design process allows for some design exploration, mm -hmm. some kind of iteration, but of course, as a client, you're paying for that each time as well. Right, so right. the idea here is that, yeah, can you, can you use the technology to create a solution space of many, many, many different um, possibilities right. and then choose the right one? And mm -hmm. change, change when it's digital, not when it's physical. <laughs> right. Well, there you change when it's digital, <laughs> not when it's physical. I like that because the reality of it is here is if you can control all of this up front and you can get your teams to look at the process up front, then the benefits, the cost savings, the sustainability, the predictability, uh, and the speed to market is all on the backside and happens much quicker. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. I think one of the things that, that we talk about a lot in design automation, people get very excited around the idea of optimization, but I don't really like talking about it like that. It's more like negotiation. All of those factors that you just mentioned, they're yep. often in conflict with each other, mm -hmm. and uh, you're trying to make decisions on how to best balance those pressures. Right. And I think that's what we try to, to give to the, to the clients up front, the ability to make those decisions and, and to, yeah, to understand those pressures and deal with them in a better way. Sure. Well, let's look at a demo here. What are you, what are you getting ready to show us? <laughs> okay, so this is Prism. This is our open source uh, web application for designing housing and residential buildings. Um, so this allows anybody to, to, to come up with uh, a residential scheme that is uh, encoded with design for manufacture logic. So we spent a, a significant amount of time capturing the, the rule sets around existing uh, DFMA products mm -hmm. from manufacturers and building those into the application. So typically, you'd spend a lot of time researching that as an architect or an engineer trying to design your building. Right. But what we're trying to do here is put that know-how into the tool itself so that whatever you do, you're getting feedback on how, uh, uh, how plausible it is for you to deliver this building with modern methods of construction. So this is a site, it's actually in central London. Uh, you can nearly see it from the, the window of the office we're in right now. Uh, and there's a couple of buildings on here already. You can see these are the different typologies that we have in the app. So right. linear apartment buildings and tower blocks and things like this. Um, and the app is parametric. So you can see this linear apartment building here. I can just grab hold of that um, and modify the, the layout of this building. Just by dragging it. Yeah, just by dragging these endpoints. So it's just a it's a yeah, linear building, so I can change all these things. And you can see on the left-hand side, we have an analytics panel, right. which is updating against um, the, the metrics. So whether that's the apartment type uh, or, or other metrics around you know square meterage or the type of system that you're using. Mm -hmm. And you can really drill into the detail of, uh, um, uh, of the design as well. So it's not just a kind of block model. Actually, we have... Um, yeah, very detailed uh, information that sits that sits behind this. So, if I can ask you, so when you're moving that around structurally, room sizes, bathrooms, or whatever is in that building, MEP chases, all adjusts automatically when you exactly. do that, and exactly. it's and it's adjusting for modern methods of construction design. So whether exactly. panel, modular, whatever that may be. Exactly, exactly. Got it. Exactly, so you can see in the detailed view here, we've got all the apartment layouts and they're all kind of linked to those design for manufacture rules. Okay. So as I'm changing the apartment mix and I get to choose whether I want one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, how mm -hmm. they're arranged around vertical circulation, I'm getting all this feedback. I'm getting uh, like a little alert so telling me what's working, what's not working. Mm -hmm. It's not a kind of sy system where the computer says no. It's always trying to work with the human as well as the machine right. to sort of give you that feedback to help you make better design decisions. Um, and so, and I can also start exploring the kind of system that I want to use. So I'm going to choose a volumetric system here. 
uh, and try and populate the design with, with modules. And so you can see that it, across all three buildings, right, right. the system has worked out the range of different so sizes. So it's color coded based on the size of each module exactly. that would go in that section based on the interior walls, exactly. chases, exactly. You know, sand pipes, all that. Exactly, yep. exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got all sorts of different uh, um, metrics coming out here. But, and, and the feedback it's giving you is saying, yeah, you could build this out of this array of modules, but maybe you want to design it so that you have more uh, so less less variation, right? Maybe it's maybe that's important, and different manufacturers have a sort of different uh, in, impression of that. But the idea is, yeah, you can just kind of mess around almost with all of these different, um, yeah, all of these different possibilities. I mean, it's really drag and you know, drag and drop. Yeah, absolutely, technology, right? absolutely. Okay. And then we get very simple feedback: red, amber, green. What's good? What's bad? It's your floor to floor height. So it, it's telling you in real time what you have to look at because it yeah. may or may not work, is what the system's saying. There's yeah. a conflict somewhere. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think one, the reason it's open source actually is, first of all, is to get designers up to, uh, up to speed with what right. um, modern methods of construction and DFMA can achieve, but also to push manufacturers to say, hey, look, your products maybe don't deliver. Uh, as much variety as you as you claim, or maybe right. maybe you can push your product development, your system development, in this direction and respond to those those designers' needs. So it's really about bringing those mm -hmm. the two parts of the design delivery process together in a piece of open source software. You, you said something I think is very interesting, right? So if I am a stakeholder, a builder, a developer, somebody that has a project, and I want to use modern methods of construction, this gives me the ability to still use my engineers and architects that I have. And this system helps them walk through that process without them having 100 years worth of experience with their 10,000 hours. Absolutely, absolutely. And mm -hmm. th th I think that there's a there's a um, uh, I think that there's a possibility for for different types of use of it. So yeah, my mom can use this and right. design a building a certain level of resolution. But if you have a bit more knowledge and a bit more know-how, we can get into the details. So for example, on screen here, this is one of the apartments. So I can choose um, to edit. Micro edit wall Inside positions. Inside the apartment. Yeah, exactly. And then populate through that change through into all the building designs as well. So I'm, it'll recalculate every floor, exactly. every level for weight loads, all of those things. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, that you know we have podium settings, we have basement, which might not be the thing that you really get into on the first pass of a feasibility right. study, but you know, the second iteration, the third, as you work through that process, you can do all of that within the tool. And you're comparing um, uh, many, many different iterative designs against mm -hmm. yeah against each other with that you know that well understood metrics consistency the transparency and back to what i said before better decisions so you get to choose the which which of those uh, negotiated pressures you want to deal with best right. and, you yeah. know in order to deliver for manufacture to deliver the project with design for manufacture uh, principles what do you really need to do to achieve that this is what the tool is trying to tell you how long does a project take to do it this way versus the traditional way? Let's say we had a project like this. I mean, I know that would be years of design and development for an engineering and architectural firm, probably. So I think that, so, I mean, the first feasibility pass of this, you can literally do in less than 10 minutes. Um, Say it again. 10 minutes? Less than 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and that gives you a certain level of information. Mm -hmm. The output of the tool allows you to bring that into the kind of more everyday proprietary tool, BIM tools and things like this right. to work up the design. Um, but, you know, producing 10, 20 feasibility studies, early mm -hmm. stage concept designs with that level of data, it's not just that it would take longer in real life or in your manual design. It's people don't do it because, right. it, because it's just not really possible. Or you get all that data for free. And you can price it, right? Like you can cost it. Because it doesn't cost anything to use this. No, exactly. It's open source. Exactly, exactly. And, and so you, you said something about BIM. All of this that I'm designing within the software, I can export that into my architectural design Absolutely. software, BIM, or whatever I'm using? Absolutely. That's really fundamental to what we do uh, in the team and the software that we build across all of our projects. We're not trying to replace those um, kind of everyday tools that designers and engineers are familiar with. We're trying to augment them. To, right. add, to add the right. extra layer of intelligence. Lo those tools are good at what they do, and they're generalized tools for everybody. And what we're trying to do is create something very specific at the front end that mm -hmm. kind of turbocharges those. So this can really take years off the design process of a complex building. Absolutely, and you know, this is an open source tool which Mm -hmm. Tons of diff different people and different organizations use, and you can shorten your design process. You can you can understand better what you should be doing, right? Fundamentally, 
I, I know it's going to come up somewhere in a question. Tell me, how do you get the data in here from the manufacturers or the MMC or even the site plan we yeah. were talking about? Like, how does all of that populate into a system like this? I mean, well, this the, this, the geographic data, so the buildings and the, the map that you see on screen, that's the easy bit, right? right like, there's a bunch right. of open source data that we can pull in. There's, there's um, uh, closed source data which you can buy and pull in. That's, the, that's just a technical question. That's easy. Getting the rules out. Easy. That, well, it is. <laughs> Getting the rules out of humans is a bit yeah. more challenging. Right. That, there's, a, there's a real kind of um, cultural change sure. about capturing those rules and sharing them. So the manufacturers that we spoke to during this project, they were quite um, reticent to share mm -hmm. what their, what their uh, constraints and design rules were. But in reality, they were, they were more or less the same between manufacturers. Their USP yeah. was not that the product was unique itself. It was more the way that they, that they right, manufactured right. it. That was where their uh, competitive edge was. And I think this idea that, that, that the design know-how that we're trying to encode into these technologies, that somehow that represents, uh, you know, that should be a secret. I think that's a big problem. And we spend a lot of time dealing, speaking with humans. A lot of sure. software development that we do. It's just about talking to people and trying to yeah. understand what those rules are. Taking human know-how and turning it into something that a computer understands, right. is, yeah. that's a very different kind of um, activity than designers yeah. are normally used to. It, well, it's a different activity and it's a different thought process. Yeah. So you're trying to change the mindset and culture of an industry that's always done it this way. Yeah. To look at it differently and realize that it's going to help them be more successful, deliver more projects in less amount of time, which is great for everybody, especially with the homelessness and the housing affordability issues. All of this plays Absolutely. into the bigger picture. Absolutely. And I think that you know, housing in particular, the, the, there's so much kind of contextual design that is required. Mm -hmm. And we're not trying to replace that, actually. What we're trying to do is, is, is allow designers to use this tool to, to automate a bunch of stuff that, is, that can be automated so that they can focus on the real value add that they bring. Right, you know, right. Architects focusing on placemaking, for example, and a better quality built environment rather than paperwork. Yeah, and for that's sure. fundamental to what we're trying to do. There's no, there is no project that we've done that automates everything. There is always the, the the balance between what the engineer, the human, is really good at, and what the computer is really good at. Right. And we don't try to kind of blur that line too much. But if you can get ninety percent of it. Absolutely. That, and then, that's a big speed up process right there. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And then, yeah, then everyone's focus is on that last 10%, making that really, really great. Sure. All right, so this is one of the, the programs mm. that you're using here. You have, you have others as we well. We do have others, yeah. We've got quite a few others. I'm going to flip to um, a completely different scale and context of uh, one of our projects. This is called Rapid Engineering Model. This is about design automation for transport infrastructure, roads uh, pre um, predominantly. Rapid engineering model, REM. Yeah, REM, with apologies to Michael Stipe. Yeah, <laughs> So, all right, well, walk me through what this is. So, uh, the origin of this project is um, uh, the design of roads in the UK, the Smart Motorways program in particular, which is a highly um, uh, productized and standardized um, way of expanding the UK's road network. Um, so, there's existing roads that, that are basically being enhanced uh, for increased capacity. Um, and we were asked to, to look at this from a digital point of view. We've never designed roads. Um, no one in, in our entire organization, I think, has, designed. has ever designed a road. No. Uh, and which actually is really useful in this kind of context because you right. kind of walk into it with a complete, um, yeah, like childish naivety. So you sort of walk in and go, why do you do it like that? Right. <laughs> and so, so you start yeah, thinking of it differently. Yeah, completely. And, yeah. And, and sometimes you're just completely wrong. And sometimes you actually bring something totally different that's, that's of value. And so as we spoke to the client, we understood that there was a considerable amount of rules, a considerable right. amount right. of standardization within the products that are being used. And therefore, this should be something that could be automated. Um, and so, yeah, over the last yeah, four or five years, I guess, we've been developing this with National Highways very closely with them. Uh, and this is, this is probably the most um, extreme example of right. flipping this kind of the paradigm of engineers and architects having the yeah. design control and giving it, giving it instead to the clients. So they're delivering a number of these schemes every year. So they're typically, I don't know, 20 miles, 30 miles long, um, hundreds of millions of pounds. Uh, they're doing a large number of these every year. It's a five, right. 10 year program. Uh, and so they need quality across their schemes, sure. consistency, and yeah. safety is obviously a really big factor. So we built uh, a bunch of design automation tools that would suck in a bunch of data, as you mentioned before. We're taking yeah, 
not just open source data in this case, kind of environmental data, mm -hmm. um, LiDAR captured topography data, mm -hmm. uh, road alignment, existing assets, all of these things is kind of soup of... That's already out there because yeah, it's yeah. been surveyed and shot. Exactly, yeah. we're pulling it from different sources, right. turning it into something that's usable mm -hmm. in the rapid engineering model. And it's that, that becomes the field against which we can automate. So this is, a, this is actually a real road. Uh, everything in this model has been placed automatically by our software so even the signs uh, everything yeah yeah everything so there's no no the only human intervention to this is me rotating it right now um, and it takes in accountability for drainage absolutely. and everything else right? absolutely so uh -huh. what, what we do is we pick up all of that um, uh, all of that context data so environmental factors topography all road curvature right, all these right. kinds of things uh, and we analyze the whole road for suitability, so where is a good place to build? Mm -hmm. In this case, a gantry is a sign that you can right. see here. Where is it good from an environmental point of view? Where is it good from a constructability point of view, from right. a maintenance, maintenance point of view? Um, and, and, and then position them against the rule set. Now, right. the rule set's obviously about safety and visibility and all these kinds of things. So we're trying to choose the best position for, these, for, for each of these construction interventions mm -hmm. in a longer, very, 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 very long project uh, in terms of yeah, time as well as physicality. Um, so what you see on screen here, th th we don't design the gantry automatically, but that's a product. Right. And fundamental to all of the tools we build is right. the ability to have the existence of that product catalog. But you can reach to that reach exactly to that client or supplier or manufacturer, exactly. and they'll provide you the data. Exactly, exactly, and to scale. A, exactly, and there's a, this is this is uh, the real product that they use. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a bunch of kind of um, technology that goes right. with it: cabinetry, cabling. There's drainage, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. All of these things you can see that. Uh, hopefully, you can see this retaining wall structure that's cut right. in. Mm -hmm. That's automatically um, designed as Put well. In there. So, yeah, so based around from, a set of parameters if this happens and that happens. Exactly, very yeah. simple, actually very simple decision tree. So th this project involves a whole different range of algorithmic techniques. There's, yeah. there's some procedural, there's some parametric, um, there is some generative, and there is some very simple decision tree logics as well. And I think that that's also fundamental. Like, as I said before, we're not, it's not one size fits right. all. Everything is kind of product, project specific. And we build it up in layers. This, is, this was not mm -hmm. an overnight um, uh, piece of work. Sure. It, took a, it took a long time to kind of evolve the, the, the sophistication of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And we're able to now design on Zoom Out. Maybe you see a bit the, the scale of this particular project. Um, well, just walk good. me through like the red, the green. Uh, that's cut and fills. Is that no, what, what is it? The red and green, yeah, that's a good question. The red and green is really, uh, it's risk. So against all those different types of data that we pull in, mm -hmm. um, we're analyzing the road in 10 meter segments to understand how risky it is or how impactful it would be to, right. to have construction activity there. So for example, in, in the embankment, you might have uh, the requirement for a lot of cut and fill. Right. I and mean, you don't want to do that. That's where your cost is, that's where your time goes. You might have an environmental factor that's mm -hmm. the, where you can't, you, you know, there's a huge impact if you construct in that area. There are safety factors to do with the curvature of the road, the visibility right. for drivers to signage. So all the all these kind of all the colours that you see along the road, they're, they're, that's what the computer's reading. So we take all that data, like maps and all this kind of stuff that you and I could un right, interpret, right. And understand. We turn it into something that's machine readable, uh, and so yeah, th this kind of and color coded, right? And so color you, the exactly. colors would tell you how far you are from a sign before a curve. So yeah. if you needed a hundred yards or hundred meters exactly. or whatever, then it'll point that out to you. Or say exactly. you don't have enough, you need to straighten the road here another foot. Exactly, to exactly, meet code. exactly, okay. exactly. And mm -hmm. it, it, that's the really the, the the way in which we're like we're able to iterate through. Well, right. tens, hundreds of different possibilities of sure. layout, uh, and, and to get to um, yeah a better outcome from safety point of view, from carbon point of view, from right. uh, constructability and maintenance point of view, right. uh, and then, yeah, the, the kind of in all of our projects we have some version of this red, amber, green color right, coding, right. and it, it's really the pivot point between that human know-how into something that the computer understands. The digital know-how. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and I would imagine. You know, um, you can make changes fairly quick on this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, for, for maybe for context, you can see how long this road is. Sure, this is pretty extensive. It's not even the biggest one we've done this, but the this takes about yeah about eight hours to generate this level of information. So as long as you have the data yeah. to pull in for that area, exactly. you're telling me this takes about eight hours to generate. Yeah, exactly, and that would take months and months and months of uh, manual design to get to this level. And within that eight hours, we could generate maybe in parallel you know, five, 10 different possibilities. And the accuracy of these models? 
it's as ac it's more accurate than than uh, than you can hand draw. Yeah, for right. sure, for sure. Um, and it's it's completely transparent. It's evidence based, so yeah. you can see every single. It's not a black box. Not yeah. especially in a project like this, you don't want to have a situation where nobody understands what the computer's doing. Right. You right. have to be able to make it um, transparent and understandable because you know it's public infrastructure. It's, Sure. Serious stuff, right? Right. And right. so you don't just want computer says yes or no. Oh, I don't really know why. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to have access to, to that. So actually, there's we have thousands and thousands of pages of documentation uh, that we developed with the engineering team at National Highway, so they understand all the decisions this, the tool is taking for them. Right. And then the last ten percent of it is with humans in the room. Very often. The rules that we've encoded, they conf they conflict. So you need to meet this requirement, but actually it conflicts with this right. one. So the computer never tries to resolve those. It just flags them and says, "Hey, Dave, what do you want to do here?" Yeah. And then we have so we have the kind of big room methodology, get inside the tool, drag the things around, and decide. And that's all traced in the in the digital thread. It's in the it's in the database. It's stored. So There's a footprint, uh, yeah. footprint of it all. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so you know right. you know all of the decisions that were taken. And you, know, you can look back at it in six months, three years, 20 years when you finish the project and make sure you knew why you did everything. Or why something happened. Or yeah, exactly. Look at the data and go exactly. back to it. Exactly. I mean, I, I see such value in this, not only for the DOT, Department of Transportation, or mm. highway management. One, wow, maybe we could do a project on budget and on time. <laughs> but I think on the other side, too, when you're doing a lot of these large development sites, you got to put infrastructure for roads in Absolutely. and transportation. So I can see Absolutely. this playing in that realm realm as well. Absolutely. I, I think that the, we've applied this in tons of different road contexts yep. in the UK, like not just these big, long uh, highways projects, but right. as you said, those smaller, those smaller um, complex roads that, that, you know, that, that get in the way of the building, yeah. right? <laughs> and things like this. But we've also applied the same kind of digital um, tech and method to different transport infrastructure problems. We've done it for rail. We've done it for um, well, London Underground recently at different scales. The same methodology that we're using in rapid engineering model, we've just developed um, a tool which is automating the, the layout of cabling in tunnels, which from our point of view, same problem. Yeah. I've, also, I've also never designed railways. So I kind of we kind of don't care if it's roads or rail. Right, right. The, can we apply the technology in different ways? You're contexts? not designing the train, but you're designing the infrastructure. Exactly. And the infrastructure is predictable. Exactly, exactly. Got it, got it, got it. So we're getting ready to head out of here to Tottenham Court and the Forge. Talk to us a little bit about how maybe this technology or technology has played a role in both of those projects. Well, um, Tottenham Court Road Station is part of the Elizabeth Line, recently opened. Brighton Wood, we were responsible for the um, construction information, design for manufacturing information for the tunnel lining system, which is super cool. Um, and it was a hugely kind of complex. Uh, tunnel lining. Yeah, so it's it's GRC yeah. uh, concrete panels, right. double curvature. It's I actually went to go and see it uh, on Friday myself. It's wicked. <laughs> it is. It's great actually. And it, 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 when you look at it, you think, wow, okay, well, this looks kind yeah. of, um, uh, this is beautiful. It's perfect. You don't really think how, you, as a normal person, you might not normally think how it's kind of put together, but that process was incredibly complex for the team and to to have a kind of digital backbone to it was critical for them. Right. So all the panels and all the stations we worked on, there's variations to them, there's difference to them, and you need to control that parametrically. And you, mm -hmm. need to, you need to be able to generate the design information for regulatory sign-off by the client and also for manufacturing purposes right. and deal with yeah the changes and kind of I know you said bumps in the road, but I guess bumps in the rail that come with any of these transport infrastructure projects. So we're using um, design for manufacture software, SolidWorks, to control mm -hmm. parametric models of every single component. So from every small kind of nut and bolt all the way up to the large kind of GRC right. panels. That's directly linked to construction companies, procurement process. And so the, you know, the whole thing was nose to so tail. This is a so tell us about the Elizabeth line. Well, it's a... Uh, major new railway line through through central London and beyond, uh, running east-west. Uh, Brydenwood, we were involved in um, the DFMA for passenger tunnel lining mm -hmm. system, which is a GRC concrete system, double curvature, super yeah. cool. Um, is a, and the project itself for us is yes, a great example of the kind of physical and digital um, design approaches that we have in the business, the the design efficiency that was that was realised through the physical design process was was then leveraged through very sophisticated digital modelling from terms of the three D 
models of the, the fabrication models that we created, as well as then linking all of that to procurement systems. So it was a real kind of end-to-end -end delivery, actually. And it, I don't think it would have been possible in the time frame that we were given to deliver those that, that level of detailed information across the number of stations we worked on without that real kind of connection between physical and digital design. And that physical and digital design, again, just to go back to what we were talking about, it speeds up the accuracy of Absolutely. the project, the sustainability, all of these things. So it's allowing you to to, to move much quicker, which is less impact on the environment, Absolutely. less impact on the population that's waiting for those trains or has to use those trains. I mean, there's a whole lot of you know, uh, that falls right after that. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that you know, we were able to reduce material weight hugely, right. which is goes directly to sustainability, mm -hmm. also goes directly to maintain, maintainability. Uh, so we're able to simulate all of these things through the software, yeah. simulate the construction methodology, can simulate the maintenance methodology, reduce the number of people that were needed to install and maintain these things, which again leads to ultimately reduction disruption. Yeah. Uh, in, in ongoing terms, and to make the whole thing safer. I mean, it looks really cool for sure, but it is, it, it's more sustainable, it's safer than, yeah. than uh, and was delivered much more quickly than it could have been. And it was really an agile process too, that the way that the team worked with the, the 3D, it meant that they could, they could kind of suck in uh, a point cloud scan of the, of the tunnel as it was finished mm -hmm. and adjust the model at the last moment, oh, wow. just to make sure there was no clashes, yeah. to make sure that, um, uh, the, yeah, there were not going to be a problem on site. Uh, and I think that that ability to, to wait for that information, rather than just, hey, we've made all these panels, I hope it fits, it was not like that at all. Right. I, I love it. So you can go in and scan it, get yeah. the points, and know exactly what's good, yeah. what's not, or where yeah. you need to adjust. All right, and then we have the uh, Forge. Tell mm -hmm. me about the Forge quickly and how technology played a part in that and is playing a part in it during the actual build. So Forge, again, it's another great example, I think, of, of Brydenwood physical and digital design coming together. So it's a PDFMA uh, building platform um, to design for manufacture. So the superstructure uh, it, it was... So it's a multi-story building. Yeah, so, yeah. sorry, yeah, it's a, it's a multi-story office Not a building. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a multi-story office building in central London. Also very cool. Uh, and yeah, we've applied our PDFMA yeah. um, uh, system knowledge to the to the to the delivery of that building. So the superstructure, the cladding, um, the, the services engineering, all of these things have been um, conceived from the bottom up to the ground up to be more efficient materially, to be more efficient um, in terms of productive processes for installation, uh, and to be a better performing building. Uh, and so the digital part of that has been within the capturing of the product set so mm -hmm. whether that's superstructure elements, bracketry or cladding elements or MEP elements, uh, and automatically being able to generate that model from uh, the emerging design. So right. the, the superstructure model actually, we built software that would automatically generate the, the, all of the connection details, all of the bracketry, all of the manufacturing information that was needed to, to deliver the superstructure. Sure. Again, super, super quick, better decision making uh, and yeah, intelligent, intelligence earlier. Right. I mean, I think it's just super, super impressive. So here we're sitting in central London, right? Um, but you guys are a global company. You That's got a new right. office getting ready to open up in Boston and the United States as well. So for those out there, this isn't just here being used in, in the UK or London. It's actually a global operation that you can work anywhere. That's right. Yeah, we're already spread around Europe and the rest of the world. And it's super yeah. exciting to, to make the steps into the US as well. I love it. There you have it, everybody. I am sitting here with Phil Langley, head of creative technologies, Bryden Wood. Thanks for watching.